dritte Welle. Der Finanztsunami. The third wave. The financial tsunami is here. With Ernst Wolf. Now it is here, the third wave of the financial tsunami. At least this is how financial expert Ernst Wolf sees it, who has been predicting and writing about the approaching financial catastrophe for many years. In an interview with Eingeschenk TV, Ernst Wolf explains the means by which this unprecedented financial crash is hidden, covered up and quasi washed clean. Well, the system is collapsing at the moment. And in my opinion, there is no rescue for the system. Then one should ask oneself, who is behind this World Health Organization? What we experience is basically nothing else than a financial fascist coup. And it was orchestrated internationally. And I believe that all this hysteria about the coronavirus is also for this expropriation. Because now you have to control people somehow. You have to control the people, it's best if the people are in their homes. And would be best if now a part of the internet is also switched off and the police are checking the streets. I also think it's quite possible that the next thing we'll see is a curfew. This is a historic opportunity to make people understand what is actually going on behind the scenes. I believe, for example, that the curfew which we are facing is a means of getting some fresh air for a few days and then taking some decisions. Dear viewers of Eingeschenk TV, quite spontaneously we drove to Berlin today over an amazingly empty highway and sit here together on March 20th, 2020 at 12 o'clock. That's the time where we record this video now. The events seem to turn over and already tomorrow or maybe next week the world could look completely different. I welcome Ernst Wolf. Dear Ernst, you wrote the book The Financial Tsunami is Coming. Where do we stand? Is this the beginning? Are we in the middle? We are right in the middle of it and what we are experiencing at the moment is the last big wave in this tsunami. Well, we have already experienced two bigger waves. The first was in 1998, when the financial system was already on the verge of collapse. The next time was 2007-2008, when it was rescued by the world central banks with huge injections of money into the system and more and more interest rate cuts. And now we probably have the final wave. Because with these crashes we have experienced in the stock markets, with what we have experienced in the bond markets, the derivatives bond must have burst in the background. So that system is done. We are currently experiencing the complete and total collapse of the financial system which has existed for 70 years. We both know that in theory such an uncovered fiat money system with compound interest etc. has a limited lifespan. Right. Now in the past central banks have always tried to keep all kinds of doomed men alive a little bit by cutting interest rates and ever more abundance of money. So will that work again? I suspect that this time it will not succeed. In fact, we had the big turnaround last December. Ever larger sums were fed into the system, interest rates were lowered more and more and then attempts were made to normalize the system again. So to get back to a normal mode, that went wrong last December. Since last December we have seen interest rates had to be cut again and they had to be cut quite drastically. We have now had two interest rate cuts in the United States and they had to be quite drastic. 1.5% and then again I think it was 1.5 or 1.25 last time. In any case now in one go to zero. Exactly. And that was on Sunday night. Yeah, right. While on Wednesday there would have been a regularity meeting and it was of course a signal to the markets, the hut is burning, we can't wait until Wednesday. Right, and it also shows that the central banks no longer have the option of saving the system any further. Well, they only have these two possibilities. They can feed more and more money into the system and they can lower interest rates further and further into the negative range. But these last interest rate cuts no longer worked. All the investors still sold their shares. The people, the investors, went into the bonds en masse and insane amounts of gold and silver were bought. So the system is collapsing at the moment. And in my opinion, there's no rescue for the system. 
And because of that reason, you have to look for someone to blame for this collapse, and I think this someone has been found, in form of a virus. But he has no address, right? Right. So I'm not a doctor now. I don't know anything about medicine, but I'm good at reading and writing, and I know that there is something wrong with that, what we are told. So as far as the virus is concerned, I also let myself be bullied a bit in the beginning. So when the first reports came from China, when all these horror reports came from Italy, but you have to sit down there and check exactly where these reports come from. And all the reports that is about these cases of illnesses and so on, they come from the World Health Organization. Then you should ask yourself, who's behind this World Health Organization? The World Health Organization was founded in 1948 by several states. And in the first decades, it was mainly financed by these states. But that has changed. That is in the course of deregulation. That has been a very important phenomenon in the financial system. Deregulation has been accompanied by a huge wave of privatization. And the World Health Organization has also been affected by this wave of privatization. Since the 1970s, state funding has been steadily reduced and more and more private contributions have been received. These are foundations and the pharmaceutical industry has gone in. And today, more than 85% of the World Health Organization is financed by foundations and the pharmaceutical industry. Is the WHO a lobbying body of the pharmaceutical industry? I would say, well, I mean, if you look at the financing in the background, you have to say that the strongest influence is not exerted by individual states, but by foundations and the pharmaceutical industry. And foundations are nothing more than organizations that rich people use to hide their money from tax authorities. Hmm. Okay. Well, that's not very trustworthy. And the biggest foundation at the moment, which is quite interesting, the biggest foundation at the WHO is the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And they hold huge shares, so they are pretending to be a humanitarian organization, but you just have to look at the block of shares they own. Well, they have huge holdings in the Coca-Cola and Pepsi-Cola companies that don't exactly serve public health. That's very interesting, but they have a very big influence on this organization and of course the big pharmaceutical companies do too and then you have to look what has happened in the past with other other pandemics I have now taken a look at what happened in 2005 when the so-called bird flu was rampant and there was a very similar reaction from the World Health Organization as today for example there was an influencer director at the WHO who said in 2005 we expect 7 million deaths so at that time, there was also an incredible hysteria because of this hysteria, governments bought huge contingents of drugs from the pharmaceutical industry. Well, the bottom line at the end of the day was that there were just over 150 deaths worldwide due to bird flu, not a single death in Germany. But the deal was made. The deal was made. And it's quite interesting to note that this influenza director moved to one of the largest pharmaceutical companies in the world, namely Novartis, in 2007. Ah, okay. Well, you can already see all these interests in the background that are working there. And I think it's important to recognize that, because then you can somehow classify the whole situation today even if you're a medical layperson. And then you don't need to be so addicted to all this hysteria at the moment. Okay, so now that's a clear hint. There are people who make money from this kind of scare stories. But at the same time, we have this derivatives bubble that is bursting. Stock prices are falling, all kinds of things are falling. The first companies are closing. At first, the states seem to respond with the usual medicine, which has not helped in the past. Even more money, even more money, even lower interest rates, short-time pay, unlimited aid, etc. And now, as a, re as a result of this corona hysteria, this meets a situation where the states worldwide are, so to speak, shutting down their economies in a concerted action. That is aggravating. I always tell my customers, the money supply will then be inflated again, while the supply of goods and services will become smaller due to this blackout, which is now being quasi-ordered. And isn't that actually the perfect recipe for hyperinflation? 
Yes, yes, definitely. In the long term, that would be the beginning of a hyperinflation. Well, we have seen that in, I think, Hong Kong was the first state to use helicopter money. So helicopter money, that is a certain amount of money, is simply transferred to every citizen by the central bank or the government. The United States also announced it last week. Other governments have now also expressed their intention to consider this. For me, helicopter money is the last desperate attempt to save the system that can no longer be saved. Because helicopter money cannot be paid just once, helicopter money must be paid at regular intervals. Especially when you are now totally choking the economy, you have to give this money to people in order to survive. And this money must be put into consumption immediately. And this will of course mean that the prices will go up. It will result in hyperinflation. But I don't think this will last long. But sarcastically speaking, I could say that the helicopter is a good idea because the price of oil has just dropped, right? Yes, this is the second important arena. Because at the moment we not only have the complete collapse of the entire world financial system, but we are also on the threshold of a new order the global strategic order. In fact, there was an event in March which was not really discussed so much in the public. It was the OPEC conference in Vienna. That was where the OPEC countries, that is the organization of petroleum exporting countries, met. And there's another organization, OPEC Plus. It includes Russia and other countries. Together they are the biggest oil producers in the world. And Saudi Arabia, so far one of the most important allies of the United States in the Middle East, has openly opposed the United States here. And the whole thing has been kind of masked. Saudi Arabia and Russia have allegedly not been able to reach an agreement because the point was actually to reduce production. Keeping the price up. Yes, because at the moment there is simply too little production, too little oil is being demanded. And that's why they want to limit the production volumes in order to keep the price reasonably high. They didn't agree on that and in the end there was a big rumpus supposedly between Saudi Arabia and Russia. But if you take a closer look, the big loser in this matter is the United States of America. The fracking. The United States have tried to become energy independent through fracking and have even managed to do so in the recent years. Well, they are self-sufficient. For years they were one of the biggest importers of oil, but this fracking industry into which, by the way, hundreds of billions of US dollars, including speculative money, have flowed in huge amounts. This fracking industry needs relatively high price for oil. It's around 60 to 70 dollars. So there are several... Yeah, definitely. With 20 or 26 dollars where we are now, they write huge losses. Exactly, they collapse these companies. Many investors lose their money. And we have to consider that we are currently have the largest credit bubble in the world. So all the loans that are due cannot be serviced at the moment. That means that the amount of bad loans is growing exponentially at the moment. And of course, that means that the financial system is being squeezed from several sides at the moment. And this financial system cannot survive in the long run. The other thing is the derivatives bubble. One has to consider that the fall of the oil price alone to this price below $30 would have caused the derivatives bubble to burst because all transactions and the oil is the most traded commodity in the world and all transactions in the oil sectors are hedged by derivatives. Derivatives are not just bets, they are also bets that are used to hedge transactions. And these hedges only work if prices are kept reasonable high. So this is one of the phenomena that we have seen in the last years, that the central banks have always prevented the stock markets from crashing, the bonds markets from somehow getting out of control. The main reason for keeping the system constantly in balance it was the huge amount of derivatives in the background. And the crazy thing about this is that nobody knows how many derivatives exist in the world. So the Bank of International Settlements in Basel, they always give us estimates for this and according to their estimates it is an amount of 700 trillion which is breathtaking in itself nobody knows how much is traded a lot is traded OTC exactly there are these OTC over-the-counter transactions that do not have to appear in the books of the companies that means that there's a very large black area that you can't see and insiders estimates it to be 1.25 quadrillion at the moment and even if that 
that's not true. Even if it only the figures of the BIS in Basel are correct, even then, this derivatives bubble has definitely burst in the last few days. In other words, the world financial system is at the end at the line of the moment. This can be compared to a hare killed with buckshot. A hare will then run about 30 to 40 meters further and then only will stop. It's actually already dead, but it doesn't stop until the end. So when I hear these dimensions, the 750 billion euros that the ECB now wants to pump into the financial system again by buying all kinds of assets, obviously including high-heeled bonds, possibly also shares, that is really just a little watering can for a huge inferno. That is too little, too late. If you look at it at a higher point of view, but it is of course a service for major investors. After all, the money doesn't go to the population, it goes to the major investors. The US government is currently in the process of providing the Boeing company with huge amounts of money. This is the company that had made billions and billions of profits over the last decades and now, just before the house collapses, they are getting support money. So what we have at the moment is a burning house from which the last assets are quickly taken out with the intention of looting and distributed to the major investors. Well, but even without this derivatives bubble, which is of course much bigger in dimension with this shutting down of the economy would drive even simple small and medium sized companies, which cannot afford to be without sales for four or eight weeks into insolvency. Yes. So we have defaulting loans, we have problems in the banking sector, which was already having problems. So that means that this is now a conscious inducement of a crash. That is, a crash is induced quite deliberately. In principle, this financial system is not only shot, but also poisoned and stabbed at the same time. Right. And there's also looting at the end. And there are some more interesting phenomena at the last week. That is, last Tuesday, the company VW announced that they will shut down a lot of car factories in the next week because of the coronavirus. This is a completely insane thing, because normally VW would have announced something like this on Friday evening after the stock exchanges are closed, because they know that an announcement like this would cause a huge drop in the stock prices. But now something else comes into play. You can also earn a lot of money from falling prices by short selling. So if you knew beforehand, many incenders who knew beforehand that VW would make this announcement on Tuesday morning, you could make short sales beforehand, that is betting on falling prices, and you made a lot of money last week. It works as long as the issuers can still deliver, and that is again at the expense of the issuing banks. Yes, as I said, we are experiencing, we are in the final phase of this monetary system and we are experiencing the, an absolute orgy of looting by the major investors at the moment. Okay. For the little one, this is of course horrendous. Another thing I'd like to mention is that Amazon, for example, hired 100,000 new people in the United States last week. So Amazon is one of the really big winners, one of the biggest companies in the world. And first of all, you have to consider that Amazon is a company that hasn't paid taxes worldwide for the last two years now, but on the contrary, has even taken taxes from the United States. Such a company profits from the crisis at the moment in an enormous way, while all the small companies go bankrupt in rows. But we also have to ask ourselves what will happen now, because the situation we are now in cannot continue in the long term. And that was my follow-up question. What do you think now? I mean, now we are in the area of predicting acceptations. Yes, that's why Very right. this video is so urgent and so dangerous. And dear viewers, there is a button down here, not only subscribe, but share and share that now. So now let's go on with it. What does the future hold? Yes, this is very, very difficult to predict. And I don't have a silver glass ball either. But you can do certain things you can definitely predict. So this system is no longer salvageable. So it has to be operated somehow. So there are several ways. There's the possibility of a monetary reform. In Germany, for example, the borders now have been closed. And there's also the possibility that the Deutschmark could be reintroduced. There's also the possibility that Germany might cancel all its debt to the EU, because Germany has guaranteed a great deal with the EU for other countries, and that naturally burdens the German budget. 
And there's the possibility that one day the people will say, we cannot pay back all the debts to the EU. Another possibility is the reintroduction of the Deutschmark. However, that will be not enough. What I suspect is that the IMF plan soon will be implemented. After all, the IMF has already proposed in 2013 to expropriate all citizens at a certain percentage. This means that 25 or 50 percent of the citizens' accounts will be shaved off. Yes, well, a currency reform is always associated with expropriation, so to speak. Normally, a currency reform is such that one expropriates the currency via the new rate. But I don't think that alone will be enough in this case. So you mean an Equalization of Burdens Act 2.0, like this? Exactly, exactly. And which asset classes do you think are in danger now? I think that all asset classes are in danger at the moment, because we have seen that in the past. You just have to look what has been done in Greece or Cyprus. In Cyprus, when the great expropriation took place in Cyprus, the IMF first proposed to take 25% from the people. But then the politicians came and said, you know what, you can sell it to the people because it will cause a huge uprising here. And then they agreed, I think it was 20,000 or 50,000 in the end, were allowances, so they were in tax, or nothing was taken from them, but only from 50 to 100,000 was something taken from the people. But I don't think that this will be the case this time. And I believe that this whole hysteria that is being made about the coronavirus also serves this expropriation. Because you have to have people under control somehow. You have to control the people. The best thing is that when they are in their homes, and it would be best if part of the internet is also switched off. If the police are checking the streets, that I also think it's quite possible that we have a curfew next and that'll be announced. You know what? You're all the poorer and so much poorer and we're introducing this new currency. This way they are preparing for protests to be suppressed because people do not simply accept that. People stand up against something like this. Yes, well, a currency reform has to be if it's not to be completely uncontrolled and I don't want to be on the streets because we'll have civil war. It has to be prepared. And if you separate the whole picture from this corona story, there are curfews, at least many shops are closed and, and, and people are brought back to their homes because the tourists all have to come back. Nobody is allowed to enter and leave. And so somehow I feel like I am in the wrong movie. But if I put these dots together, it really looks like. The question now is, when? Yes, that is a crucial question. So what we are experiencing is basically nothing other than a financial fascist coup, obviously orchestrated internationally. That is interesting. All countries are participating. Yes. Yesterday I heard that the Swiss National Bank, for example, is working on a new crypto Swiss franc. It's hard to make predictions, especially when it comes to the future, but assuming there's a new money coming. What would you think the design would be? I can't say that at the moment. There may be a gold-backed currency, because gold will perhaps play a major role. But it may also be the introduction of a gold standard. But there's no agreement. I mean, at the moment, the fact is that the central banks are the most powerful players in the whole thing. That is, the central banks plus the hedge funds in the background. These are the most important, and I'm quite sure that in the headquarters of the BIS, the Bank of International Settlements in Basel, one emergency meeting after the other is currently held on the boardroom floor because we already have seen in the recent years that the central banks as a whole are coordinating their policies with one another. So just where the Swiss Central Bank was mentioned, the Swiss Central Bank is the major holder of shares in Apple, Netflix, Google and so on. So they have already helped each other to keep the share prices high, to keep the markets reasonably stable. But this scenario has now completely collapsed and now it will be decided which central banks will be the strongest and which are the weakest. And I cannot foresee how the whole thing will develop. I can only imagine that those who are spinning the strings in the background are really in need of help to get the situation under control. I believe, for example, that the curfew we are facing that is a means of getting some fresh air a few days and then take some decisions. I mean, there are enough helpers, helpers who actually want to make Defender 2020 in this area. Who knows? But does it even matter whether a central bank is strong or weak? 
are we so globalized and interconnected that in principle this whole big domino game is pushed in one place, everyone has to fall behind? Yes, of course. We have this domino effect, we are experiencing it right now, so that's why everything collapses. I bring it up because the Norwegian crown with its oil reserves, with its state fund, Norway is such a solid economy, yet the crown has also fallen dramatically in recent days. Yes, because everyone is so closely connected. It can't be just any bank, so Deutsche Bank is so closely interwoven with JP Morgan and with Citibank and so on. Nobody can decide anything or do anything without something happening somewhere else. And that's also very important for me. At the moment, the borders are being sealed off everywhere, that is, the people are being, and this nationalism is also being promoted by it. But you always have to remember that there's an international force in the world, and that is the financial financial industry, and they don't care about borders, they don't care about borders at all. But they have always exploited the borders to their advantage. So if one country somehow seems stupid to them, they have moved to another country, so they have always put the whole world under pressure. And the fact that the borders now are being closed everywhere for me is a sign that the financial entity is currently counting on people to be separated from each other nationally. And that is also a very important aspect. Yes, that's also a complete turnaround. But now, thank you. Thank you very much first. Now, our intention is not necessarily to spread fear, but to say, friends, the hut is burning and what to do now? What exactly is to do to be done now? Did you get your money from the bank yet? All right. Yes, yes, I don't trust the banks anyway, not professionally. So what is important for the individual person at the moment is simply the most important thing, of course, to understand all those connections. Because it is much easier to bear a situation when you know what forces are at work. And quite a lot of people are totally insecure at the moment because of this medical hysteria. And so I have to tell people, look who is the WHO is, look at where the data comes from, look at the videos of certain doctors who are trying to put the whole thing right. And remember, this hysteria is for someone's benefit and is being artificially inflamed. Other than that, I can tell people that it has always been important in life to have certain supplies at home, so you don't need to depend on it, depend on other people in emergency situations, because I suspect that a curfew will come. So I think that everyone should take care of himself again. But in any case, not with hamster purchases and harm other people, but you should get some reasonable supplies, maybe for one or two weeks, and that is still possible at the moment. That will be probably more difficult in the next weeks. It will probably be even more difficult because the supplies will not be so big in the next few weeks, if the economy continues to be shoved off. The other thing is that at the moment it is very important to go to the bank quickly and get some cash, because cash is very important in the near future, because I'm counting on a bank holiday that uh, you can't go to the banks, that you have to go to the cash machines, you also have to look back in history what happened in Cyprus, what happened in Greece, people had to go to the vending machines for weeks and these machines firstly there were huge queues in front of them and secondly they only have 20 euros per person at the end if there was anything left in them at all so there will be bottlenecks in any case that's why i would strongly advise every spectator to get some cash now in order to be prepared for the next days if there is enough time left now maybe we can rescue the cash assets into suitable values what values do you consider suitable First of all, I think intangible assets are more important. Well, you can convert them into tangible assets, you can buy your grandchildren what you always wanted to buy for them, or you can give your children something to make them happy. Maybe you can somehow book a language course somewhere, which can then perhaps still take an advantage after the crisis. So intangible assets are important in any case. Of course, it is to be feared that the money you have when you st have it in cash will be worthless. It is always recommended to go into gold or silver, so you can't buy bread rolls with gold. Moreover, the gold is largely sold out. If you can still get a few silver coins with silver, you can actually pay a baker or at some point of the crisis situation. So silver is still recommended at the moment. Will of course be difficult because the silver shell sellers, I think, have closed their shops in the meantime. Well, I come from the industry. The supply chains have broken down. I think last Thursday I got the message that both the Canadian and the US mint are totally sold out. 
There are no more planes flying. I mean, I could have booked a world tour quickly, but that's not possible either. Right. What is also very important is an indication for seriously ill viewers that the supply of medicines is no longer guaranteed, that one should take precautions, but also that one shouldn't buy a lot of things and take it away from seriously ill people, but that one should simply talk to one's pharmacist and one should somehow make clear to him that how long the supplies will last and one is preparing for a serious catastrophe. You raise an interesting point. We are talking about corona in this context and that is probably just a scapegoat for the so-called trigger for these confusions about death figures. We talk about death figures all the time. What do you think then? If it is about the supply of medicines and these bankruptcies, with all this uncertainty, expropriation, there are probably a million more people buying by a factor of a million because they jump out of the window or because they don't get their medicine instead of from that stupid cold. It is absolutely irresponsible. You have to say that, but we have already seen that in other countries. I mean, in Iran, children die all the time because there are no medicines, because of the sanctions and how irresponsible the politicians are. Anyone can watch the video on YouTube of the former US Secretary of State. I can't think of the name at the moment. No, it wasn't Clinton, it was Mrs. Uh, Madeleine Albright. Everyone should really take a look at this to see what kind of people is it about. In an interview where she is asked, tell me, the sanctions against Iran have cost lives about of about 30,000 children. Do you think it was worth it? And the woman actually has the nerve to say, yes, it was worth it. I mean, these are the people we are dealing with. These are the people who are running our lives now. Everyone should know that. I'm not trying to create panic. I'm just trying to get a clear view of the realities here. What else can a national government do now? Partly they are probably clueless. So you're probably often surprised how clueless politicians are, especially when it comes to financial issues. But they are all in this huge game now. And everyone is just, they are not interested in people's health. You have seen that now. Even if now I assume that this corona is really as threatening as it is now, then our government would have been incredibly negligent because all this was known at the beginning of January and nothing was done. It was only played down and it was only said that it was absurd and was Mr. Spahn who went in front of cameras and said with a smile, we have everything under control, it's not that bad. And then the same man comes along and says, yes, yes, we all must stay at home now. All schools must be closed, shops must be closed, people must be ruined en masse, small and medium-sized enterprises. The same man, you could see that he definitely has zero moral principles and neither does the whole gang around him. Yeah, yeah, I can't help noticing that pun. You can't make an omelet without breaking eggs. We will see that in the future. So, theoretically, we should have cancelled the carnival already? Yes, of course. If it was really that threatening, we would have had to cancel the carnival. Absolutely. And that was the first point where I thought, say, something is wrong here. At first I thought it was really threatening. And then there were the videos on the internet with dead bodies in body bags in China. I thought, for God's sake, what is coming? And then I thought, how can it be that they allow the carnival at the same time? Well, there are only two possibilities. Either they, it wasn't that dangerous or they were totally negligent. But the fact that they have switched it over in the meantime into the exact opposite gear makes me, as far as the, from the medical aspect is concerned, in any case, very attentive. Because I no longer believe in the great danger that was conjured up, but I do know that in the financial system there's this big, very big final wave in the tsunami. And now I understand, I can understand why all this is happening. These are very difficult times, I have to say. They are very, very difficult times. Times. And they are super dangerous times at the moment. Um, it's not up to me. I try not to panic, but they are really dangerous times. We are in the time of an orchestrated international financial fascist coup. Okay, but everyone is involved now. There's a WHO kind of involved, and a BIS, and an EU, and the Chinese, and the Americans. Everybody's doing it. Everybody's blowing a fuse. Everybody's pulling together. Do you think a world currency is also conceivable? I can't rule it out. But then we are totally trapped. You can't exclude everything. Everything is possible. So how do we get rid of all these people who are always messing with us? Well, I think 
think that the most important thing is the big enlightenment. People have to understand where it comes from. At the moment, a lot of people are locking themselves in their apartments and think that the virus is really a big threat. I've been walking around for 10 years telling the people that no disease is as dangerous as the financial system we live under. The financial entity, these are the people who are also now looting the system at its final stages. They don't care about human life. They don't care about it. They are trying to dig as deep as they can. And they are the greatest danger to mankind. But the important thing is that the vast majority of people understand that. And that is, of course, the opportunity in this situation. People are asking themselves why all this is happening. And that is why we have to explain to people how these connections exist. Let me say now, our political actors, as Andreas Pop so beautifully depicts, they now present themselves as the crisis managers, the saviors. I saw this video yesterday, this speech of our Chancellor. She has superlatives, the greatest historical change, etc. But she said it in a voice that fell asleep. The content and rhetoric don't match at all and I would soon fall asleep. Do the voters realize that? That those who share responsibility here, at least those who have represented us up to this point in recent years, so to speak, have actually, how shall I put it, give us a big performance and that it may not be possible to trust them in the future? Well, on the whole, people have this last bit of trust in the system. And I mean, Angela Merkel's performance was an attempt to calm people down a bit, to slowly introduce the next measures for them. Because she didn't say anything about what is coming next. Because I'm very sure that this curfew and other measures will come. But many people are in a panic mode at the moment, into which they are also supposed to be put. And so they cannot think clearly. And it's to them that we must turn. We must to say, look, calm down, relax, look what the real culprits are, how the mechanisms actually work, and then stand up and fight it. During curfew, they have enough time for that, as long as this video is well distributed, as, etc. I hope so. Before that, if they are still able to act before the curfew, I have supplies for at least three weeks, yes? I also have some physical precious metal, yes? I have my accounts so, so that the current bookings go off and then it's okay. And most of all, I'm not going to let myself get crazy now, because that's all I can do. Or have I forgotten something important? No, but I think one more thing is essential. This networking with other people. And in any case, to approach other people, especially in this crisis, and make these connections clear to them. That, I believe, is just as important as securing oneself with food or cash or something like that. This is a historic opportunity to make people understand what is actually going on behind the scenes. We have this historic opportunity in the situation and we absolutely must make use of it. You grew up in China? Born, raised in Korea. But you know this Chinese word for risk or, or crisis. N no, sorry, crisis. It seems to have two meanings in Chinese. Once danger and once opportunity. So it's a change now. A change is taking place in which positive things can happen, but do not have to. And now it's important that people are re reasonable and put one and one together and look after themselves. Similar to what happens on an airplane when you make a, safe, a safety announcement. You should first take an oxygen mask yourself and then help others and then help others too. Especially when it comes to who is to represent the people in this country in future. So how can we ensure that we act in the interests of the population and that we get an economic and financial system that is for the benefit of the majority and not possibly for the benefit of a, I say now quite deliberately, clique that behind closed doors plans for self-enrichment are carried out at the expense of all others. I can only emphasize that. That's all I can ask you right now. I don't want to extend it forever. Have you forgotten anything important? 
Do you have a final word? No, I don't think so. But my final word to the people outside in the case, try to enlighten as many people as possible in this situation and try to help others who are really helpless at the moment. Try to help them. I think that's the most important thing right now. Try to really act socially, try not to use this isolation to think only about yourself, but think about your fellow human beings. Above all, think about the future of your children and your grandchildren and for them it it is important that the financial system is replaced by a democratic monetary system. Thank you very much. May I shake your hand despite the financial crisis? We will be happy to shoot an interview with you, maybe in a few weeks, when we see how things have developed. I wish you all the best. Share this video and subscribe to the channel. Thanks, Ernst Wolf. Thanks a lot. Teilt dieses Video und abonniert den Kanal. Danke, Ernst Wolf. Vielen Dank.